Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, look at this little beauty. We've got this cool vintage Bulova wrist alarm. That's right. You read that right. This is not only a wristwatch, it's also an alarm clock somehow. I've never worked on one of these before. I got this one off of eBay. It said it was not running for parts which is kind of, <laughs> that makes me want to buy it and see if I can fix it. So that's what we're going to do today here on the channel. Thanks so much for coming along. On this channel, you know, we, we love to restore old things. We like to get these wristwatches back in action so that somebody else can wear it, right? Somebody wore this proudly for probably a lot of years and uh, it is now out of commission and we're going to aim to remedy that. Trying to figure out how this thing works. There's two crowns on it. It looks like this bottom crown is for setting the alarm. I know that little extra hand that you see on the uh, on the dial there is for the alarm. That's how you set what time you want the alarm to go off. But I don't really know how it works beyond that. It, it won't let me wind it. When I try to wind the watch, it won't wind up. You can see it wants to go for like half a second, but that's about it. Beautiful little watch, though. It has a distinct look with those two crowns on the side. I really like that. So let's start by taking off this uh, strap. This looks like kind of just a cheapy strap. Uh, when you buy a, a old watch on eBay, they'll often just throw like a, you know, like a $5 strap on it just to make the pictures look a little bit nicer. Uh, but at any rate, we don't need that. What we want to do is see what's going on inside this watch. So let's start by taking off the case back. And our plan here is to fully disassemble the watch, try to diagnose why it's not running, and then give it a good cleaning and a service, and then we'll try to put it back together. Uh, never having worked on one of these alarm uh, watches, I'm not actually sure what to expect. Let's take a look inside and see how this thing looks. Okay. All right, this looks not terrible. I, you know, you can tell this watch is old and used and uh, yeah, maybe actually there's a little bit of rust or corrosion in there, but not a disaster, we'll say that. Doesn't quite tell us what's going on with it yet either though. And take a look at this, on the case back, there's this post that's been applied to it. I'm not 100% sure what that's all about, but maybe we'll figure it out a little bit down the road. You can see the balance is moving, so that's good. This thing over here, I believe, is the hammer that makes the noise for the alarm. And it looks like it's uh, kind of stuck. Yeah, so look at this. When I wind up the watch, it just immediately unwinds each time. There's no click. Normally, there would be a click that would hold it, hold the wind so that you can wind it one way and it doesn't unwind the other, but that doesn't seem to be working here. So that could be the issue with this watch. We'll have to see. Oh, there we go. So I think that that is supposed to be the click right there, but it's not being, there's no pressure. So it's gummed up or, I don't know, there's something wrong with that because it should be pushing on this bigger wheel at the bottom so that it can't unwind. All right. So let's start by taking off the crowns. There are two of them and we're going to have to sort of track them. This one doesn't seem to do anything when it's pulled out, but when it's pushed in, if you turn it, it sets the alarm. And then the other one, as normal, pulls out and sets the time. So that's what we know so far. In the meantime, though, we can just take these crowns out. I think that they're the same. I hope that they're the same as each other. A little bit stubborn, but there it comes out. Okay, and there's the other one. Oh, I do see a little bit of rust there too. This is a well-worn watch. Let's take a quick look at these. Oh yeah, they are the same. So that's really nice. That means that we don't have to take special care to remember exactly which one's which. It looks like they designed them exactly the same. All right, further disassembly. Now we need to take off this front bezel. A lot of uh, vintage watches have a removable front bezel like this that comes off and holds the crystal. And this one is just like that. Take a look at that crystal later on down the line. Probably gonna just end up replacing it, but we'll see. All right, now I can just pop the movement out of the case, set the case aside. And there we go, we got the movement, but it still has the dial and hands on it, and those will need to be removed so that we can safely work on the watch. The dial and hands, of course, are probably the two most um, prominent cosmetic aspects of a watch, right? The dial really kind of makes the watch in many ways. And so we need to make sure that we keep it safe and not scratched up. This one has a nice patina on it. 
you can see it's got kind of a, a little bit of a pattern going on it. I'm probably not gonna try to clean that dial. That, in my experience, is a very risky proposition. And even though this one does look like it has a little bit of wear, that to me doesn't look like the type of wear that you just clean off and have it look all clean. It looks like the type of wear that takes whatever it's attached to with it. So my plan right now at least is to not mess with this dial. I'm just gonna put it in one of these little dial cases that I use. This just protects it and keeps it safe while I'm working on the rest of the watch. Okay, we can put the crowns back in now as well since I'm not exactly sure what it is that we're gonna to need to remove. I wanna let down the mainspring, but it's already let down because there's nothing actually holding it. <laughs> so I guess I don't need to do that. And the other crown, I don't know if needs to be in there, but I'll just leave it in for now. We'll start off how we always do. We'll take the balance out. I'm really relieved, by the way, to see the balance spinning a little bit. That means that the pivots, which are kind of like the axles on that balance wheel, are still intact. And it's a very common um, scenario that you buy a vintage watch and the, the pivots are broken on the uh, balance wheel. And it's a pain to fix. I've done it on the channel multiple times, but that's kind of not really where you want to start. You know, you're already looking for parts and they're if you buy the replacement part, it's very tricky to install. If you buy the whole new balance, that can be kind of expensive. So we'll start by taking this little cover plate off. I actually don't know what it covers up. It looks like where that click gear is though. Ooh. There's some rust under there. Oh yeah, so this got wet for sure. Some type of water ingress um, got in there. Yeah, what was, yeah, there's even some kind of chewed up metal in there. I wonder if there's something damaged or something because of how gunked up that was. Well, we'll have to address that later um, and maybe clean up that rust a little bit. Well, and here comes the, uh, <laughs> the train wheel bridge. I loosened it and it just fell right off. So I guess that's where I was going to put it anyway. You can see some rusty bits in the movement. Again, this one's not a total disaster, but it is in dire need of a cleaning. And uh, this could also explain part of why it's not running though. The main reason would be that the click isn't working and we can't get the mainspring to actually hold any power in it. This is a manual wind watch and uh, you need to be able to wind it up in order for it to do anything at all. Okay, so we could take the crown wheel off here. Whoa. Oh, well, that's weird. There's actually another crown wheel underneath. Huh. A dual crown wheel setup. We'll have to figure out what that's for later. It does look like one of the crown wheels lines up with the ratchet wheel here. So that makes sense. That's how we would expect it to be. But it looks like there's an auxiliary one that does something else. Okay, you can take this little gear that was attached to that rusty bridge out. And this one looks like it needs to be... Ah, okay, so that's kind of interesting. There's this extra geared setup that's actually attached to the barrel arbor that goes into the mainspring. Hmm. I have an idea about what that's for. When you have an alarm function on a watch like this, it does need to draw power from something, right? If you're gonna make something click or buzz or move or do anything, well, something has to power that. And I know um, that some of these types of alarm watches from the 50s and 60s, actually have two like spring barrels, like a main spring barrel and then a secondary one and the secondary ones for the alarm. But from what I can tell here, this one does not have that. And my guess is that's, they use the power from the main spring to make the alarm go. And that little system that I took off on the top there is what actually accommodates that. Okay, there's a bridge that goes over the middle here. It goes over the center wheel and it also accommodates the uh, extended center seconds pinion here as well. So I can remove both of these. And I gotta flip the watch over though to actually take that wheel out because on the other side, the cannon pinion is friction fitted to that center wheel. I'll show you in just a minute when we get in there, but for now there's this weird extra setup on top of all of that. This is clearly alarm related as this is not something that you see normally. And I can take off the regular hour wheel now and then that right there is the cannon pinion, that the one that's sticking up. And that's actually attached to the wheel on the other side and I need a special tool to remove it, which I'll do in a minute. For now, we can continue to 
take apart what looks to be more of the alarm works here. There's this long arm bar that goes all the way across the movement and it touches where that, uh, that hammer was. That's what they call that on a watch like this. Okay. Here comes the cannon pinion. Boop. So I use my cannon pinion removal tool, take it off. And what that'll do is free up the center wheel on the other side. And as you can see, it already fell off. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, continuing with the disassembly now, I can take off the barrel bridge. Although no, this actually isn't the barrel bridge. This is a, I don't know what call it, maybe a alarm bridge or something. Yeah, take a look at this. There's some cool stuff here. This holds uh, both of those crowns and you can see that there's a keyless work set up to support those. And then there's this thing. This thing is clearly related once again to the alarm and it's held in place by this sort of spring-loaded arm. So let's take that off and see if the uh, if that gear will come out. There's a spring-loaded arm. And the answer is no. Nope, that's still stuck. So there's something holding that in on the other side. We'll have to sort that out later. Yeah, in the meantime, we can now take off the barrel bridge. But that rust is pretty annoying. Um, it is making these screws very difficult to remove as you have to be very, very careful because if the top is rusted and you or get a little bit sloppy, you can just strip the top of the screw and then you're in real trouble. Though we did dodge that bullet this time, so now I can take off this barrel bridge and, well, oh, took the barrel with it too. And it looks like, I see, so that little gear that was on top of the barrel is kind of holding it in place. We'll set that aside for now. And I don't know what this is, but again, it's alarm related and that's the hammer for the alarm. I know that. Now I can finish up the disassembly here on this side of the movement by taking off the pallet fork and the pallet fork bridge. Whoop, I jumped. Okay, now we've got that out. There are a couple of more things here. So these are the setting lever screws for both of the crowns. And they need to come out. Ooh, that was really stuck in there. Yeah, those are gonna need a good cleaning. And I'll use some grease on there as well to make sure that they don't get stuck like that again. Now that one was easier. And there's some type of setting lever on the other side. And no, oh, this thing still doesn't wanna come out. Let's flip the movement over. I can just continue disassembling this. Oh no. Oh boy, that screw just jumped away. Um, all right, well, I'm not sure exactly where it went, but let's just go ahead and take out this part first. Uh, that is not what you wanna have happen though when you're doing watchmaking. Parts kind of jumping away where you can't see them. Now, sometimes they just pop back up on the movement and you go, okay, there it was. It just jumped to the side. I don't actually see that here. So yeah, it's that time. <laughs> I have to get out the flashlight and the magnets. I've made this magnet set up here. Those are rare earth magnets on a ruler. <laughs> and look at that. I found it on the ground. So there's the screw that I dropped. <sighs> Got away with one here. I'll tell you that. Now I can finish taking off the spring, and I'm gonna be very careful with that because those type of springs really love to jump away and I may not get so lucky as I did just now. And it looks like there's a big kind of control arm that goes over to where that um, that hammer it was eventually. It looks, actually it's a two-part piece. Uh, this one's a little stuck in. This one. I can remove. Okay, well, we'll take that out at least. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna put this screw back where it was because it's kind of a weird screw and I wanna make sure that I get it in the right place and I'll just put it there for safekeeping. That way I'll know this one goes here when I come back on the other side. And whoop, <laughs> there goes that other part of the arm. Oh, and the little thing finally fell out the bottom too. I guess we figured out what was holding that in place. Only a couple more things to do to get this disassembly apart, but uh, I'm getting a little dizzy. I, you know, this is, um, 
there's a lot of parts on my bench and I don't know how these alarm watches really go together. Like there's some parts I still don't actually know what they're doing <laughs> in the movement. So uh, this one might be one of those big projects. And by the way, did you see that? That little spring wanted to jump, but I used that plastic stick there to hold it in place. Thank goodness. And now I can remove this yoke. I'll just throw back, uh, throw the balance back on before doing any type of watch cleaning machine stuff. That way the balance is safe and can be put through the machine. Yeah, this is a cool one. Bulova is actually a really old company. They're not popular anymore, uh, but they do still make watches. You will see them, but they don't really have the prestige that they once did. But they were, they go back to 1875 and they're actually an American company when they were founded. They were founded in New York. Okay, I can apparently just remove this little gear, but boy, that was almost rusted on there. You can see this is where some of the water got. Yeah, there's some staining and rust there too. Yeah, Bulova's owned by Citizen Watch now. They kind of traded hands a bunch of times. But they used to be a big time manufacturer. Okay, well, where did the, there we go. <laughs> Fell down. Uh, well now we can take the mainspring out so that it can get a good cleaning too, though I have to say it looks pretty good. That said, I want to make sure that we can clean the barrel and everything as well, because there was some rust there. So now we can put all the parts in these little baskets. This is part of the deal when it comes to doing the whole watch cleaning thing is that you need a way to make sure that all the parts stay together because they're gonna be sloshed around in some pretty hardcore cleaning fluids, three of them to be exact. And you wanna make sure uh, you know, that while that's happening, all the parts are safe and not you know, getting lost in the machine. So let's put this thing in the watch cleaning machine. This is it right here. This is an old one, probably made even before the watch that we're working on was made. <laughs> it's pretty old, but you, it's a simple device. You just attach the mesh basket with all the parts in it up to the top here. And that's just a motor on top that will spin it back and forth. And then you plunge that into uh, cleaning solutions like this one. And the machine will simply move that basket back and forth to agitate it and allow that cleaning solution to get into all the parts and really take care of business. So while this thing gets cleaned up in my watch cleaning machine, I did wanna mention that I have a Patreon for this channel. That's right, it's patreon.com slash wristwatchrevival. If you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support me, that's the place to do it. Um, you get some cool little perks. Everybody who signs up on the Patreon gets a thank you card and a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail and you get access to some early stuff and some cool stuff over there too. So thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Here is the movement all done and out of the watch cleaning machine. And I have to say it looks way better. <laughs> Took off a good amount of that staining and dirt and it just looks like it needed it. Now, transferring over to the microscope here, that one part that had a significant amount of rust, it needs a little bit more work. As you can see, it's kind of that plated on rust. It's not like the, the metal's just falling apart, but there's some staining and some debris and so I'm just gonna get in there with some peg wood and get it cleaned up. This is what it looks like after being cleaned with the peg wood and then I'll still put it through another cycle on the cleaning machine too. So much, much better if I don't say so myself. Now, oh, we can start with the reassembly. So not 100% sure what was wrong with the watch. Pretty sure that, the, that there's something missing on the click. So that was part of it. Um, that was definitely uh, one of the reasons, but it could be any number of reasons why the watch wasn't running. I also have to figure out how to put this thing back together because I've never done one of these watches before and it's a little more complicated than I thought it would be. So we'll start off by using my mainspring winders to get the mainspring wound back in. And that of course means that we get to put the mainspring back in the barrel. And I'm telling you, there's no better feeling than this one. Watch this. So nice. So what it does is it expands in there and then just clicks into place. And I'm telling you, if you've never done that before, you have to. It feels so good to know that spring is all safe and sound back in its little home. Okay, we put the uh, the barrel arbor back in and then I can put a little bit of lubrication on the top where it meets the lid here and then I can put the lid on. I've got a little plastic tool 
that I use to secure the lid. It, it's not necessary. You can use tweezers if you want, but this applies pressure to the entire lid at once so that it makes sure that it sits flush and clean. And that's why I like to use it. You can see that barrel also kind of worries me. It spins nicely, but it does have some damage um, on the bottom of it there. I don't know if that's gonna cause any issues, but uh, that's something that we'll have to keep our eye out as well. Okay, now I can put these two uh, setting lever screws into the holes that they're gonna go on. Because remember that one bridge, it actually covers those up. Now, before I do that though, I am gonna put some grease on here. I just wanted to do a quick test fit first to make sure that uh, that they were gonna work right. But there we go. And now the blue stuff that you see me use is kind of the heavy duty grease. And speaking of that, this part looks like it engages in a fairly heavy duty way. When it comes to watches like this, and really any watch, you sometimes can find a, a schematic about the watch that tells you how to rebuild it um, with regards to the oiling that you need to do. It doesn't give you like step by step, but it shows you where you're supposed to put oil. But I don't have that for this and I couldn't find one. And so I'm just going to have to use my intuition and best practices to look at places that look like they have friction, try to estimate how much friction will be there and choose the appropriate uh, oil for that. So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm going to put this sort of spring loaded arm that holds that weird little pinion thing up first, like so. And I had to move the center wheel out of the way, but I can put it back into place now. And then I can put this wheel that I believe I now know what it does. So I think that that's the thing that spins ultimately and knocks this hammer. Because if you look at the bottom of the hammer, there's this sort of hook that in integrates with the uh, that star wheel at the bottom. And so I think that that's, it spins and it hits it back and forth. So that's what makes that hammer go. And I have to put those into place because the barrel bridge here actually has jewels for both the hammer, where the pivot is for the hammer, as well as that star wheel thing. And that's what I'm trying to get aligned here because I can't tack it down with the screws until I know for sure that these things are in the right place. And it looks like they're not because they're just kind of flopping around. There we go. You see how it engaged with those? That's how you know it's good to go. See, and I can move this back and forth and it moves freely now. So what that means is I can uh, screw it down now. Yeah. That's what I want to see, that free movement. There's always a concern when you're putting down bridges like this, especially for these bigger ones, that one of those pivots is not aligned and then you screw it down and it bends it or breaks it as a result. And that's why like I'm using that plastic stick to hold down the bridge even though it's just sitting there because I just wanna be extra sure that it doesn't shift when I like go grab a screwdriver and I don't notice and then I come back and I screw it down and I hear a ping or a snap and I go, oh no. I just broke a pivot on one of these things because I wasn't paying attention, right? So that's why, you know, you just take those little extra precautions. Okay, now there's this bridge that goes across for uh, the center wheel, and I can put that back into place. So, so far, so good. Not too bad, right? And a little bit of oil here or grease, I should say, on the cannon pinion, or where the cannon pinion is gonna go, I should say. I can put that down, like so. And now there's that screw that I left behind, remember? Hey, look, it's right where I left it. And I can put this kind of control arm thing. Again, I believe that you can see where that goes up against that post. That post is on the bottom of that hammer that we already put in. So I think it just hits that post a bunch and makes that hammer move. And I suppose that just makes noise. I'm not sure. Yeah, you can see right there that it, it can touch that post. Okay, a little bit of grease here on this post over here. 
as it's the other half of that arm. And I can set that into place now as well. Now there's also a spring that pushes up against that. And that's just a tension spring, meaning that it's gonna allow it to be in one position or the other. And you need some form of tension to do that. Oh, there we go. Is that gonna stay? <laughs> uh, you gonna stay spring? Okay, you are, all right. That I don't know if I trust that one, but it's in there for now. Now it can use a little bit of medium viscosity oil to get these wheels in here. These transfer power from some type of winding mechanism. In this case, these are intermediate wheels to help set the hands. So one of them sets the actual hands when you pull out the, the bottom crown or the top crown. And the other one sets just that one hand, the one for the alarm. That's what I'm covering up here is the the wheel that transfers that twisting energy from the crown over to the hand itself. And that's why those two wheels look so similar. Okay, get that down and just make sure <laughs> that it spins freely. Since there are so many similar parts, I'm just trying to be aware that I could mix one up and I wanna make sure that uh, if that's the case that I catch it early. So this might, might be like a, kind of like a gong, right? If you've ever seen um, the inside, there's a certain type of watch called a minute repeater that chimes. It, it When you activate it, it actually tells you what time it is via sound. Um, and they use a long piece of metal to chime and it's called a gong. And I, this might be what this is for this. Although uh, I'm not, I don't have my hopes up that this is going to be a nice sound <laughs> because there is no like chiming mechanism that I know of on here. I think it's more just a thing to make noise, which isn't that exactly what you want to hear first thing in the morning when you set your alarm watch, just something to just scream at you. Okay. Now I can put this extra piece on top of the hour wheel. And as far as I'm concerned, this is for the alarm itself, but be honest with you, I'm not hundred percent sure how it works. Usually, even if I don't 100% know how it works, I'll just sort of trudge forward and kind of sort it out after the fact. Okay, now I can put in this yoke. This is the more traditional yoke and setting lever spring, that, or, and setting lever, I should say, that we're used to seeing on the watches that I do. This, is, this one doesn't have anything to do with the alarm. And that's a yoke spring. Born to fly, but not today, my friend. So I'm gonna use this piece of black plastic again to make sure that it's secure before I let go. So I don't have to get out the uh, the light and the magnet again and get down on the ground. And this is a setting lever spring. Again, this is all like a little kind of miniature version of what we normally see here on the channel for these types of watches, These this age of watch. Not exactly sure how old this watch is. It's 50s or 60s. There was a few companies that made these. There's one called the Vulcane Cricket, which is a similar design. Bulova made them too. JLC made them. It's a pretty practical function, really. Like, especially if you traveled back then. Like, nowadays we just have alarms on our phones and kind of everywhere. But, you know, there was a long time where people made portable alarm clocks that you would take with you. Like it folded up into a little box. And then when you got to where you were going, you would unfold it, wind it up and set it so you could wake up. Now, you know, basically every hotel room already has an alarm clock in it. But I assume that wasn't the case for some period of time. Okay, so the main keyless works is good. Oops, okay, well, <laughs> this other one less good. This is a finicky operation that is a setting lever for this other side, but I kind of need it to be in place up against that part that I put in so that it can screw in. And so that's why I have to do it with my hand. <laughs> but I did, so there we go. And now I can put the other winding stem and crown in, if I can, if I can. Oh, there we go. 
It went in. Beautiful. And I'll make sure that it's secure so that it's not going to go anywhere while I do the rebuild. And once again, this pinion just keeps jumping out and it wouldn't come out to the end and it looks like it's one of the last things to go in as well. Okay, so this is the, what did I call it? Alarm bridge? I call it the alarm bridge. And it has a pivot hole at the top there for that big pinion. And then it also covers up uh, multiple other parts as well. But it is a little bit spring-loaded, which is a little bit annoying because when you're trying to screw something down, if it's pushing back up against you, it can be a little bit annoying. But just with a deft touch, we can uh, make sure that these screws go in. And we can flip the movement back over here because we've got some lubrication to do. This is on the regular keyless works. A little bit of grease in between the components that are rubbing metal on metal is really important. It makes the operation of the watch smoother and also, of course, protects against wear or any type of like, uh, you know, shavings coming off or anything like that. I did put a little bit too much on, though, so I'm going to use some Rotico, which is just kind of a putty that you can use for a bunch of different purposes to uh, remove the excess grease there. And on the other side, this, yeah, see, I knew it. This is how you uh, engage the alarm you pull that out and that says, okay, the alarm's ready to go. And then there's that mechanism in the middle that when it hits that time that it should go, go off. Okay, back on the other side of the movement though, we can start getting back to kind of the normal stuff here. <laughs> Put the escape wheel and the third wheel in. Like that. And the fourth wheel can go in as well. It's got an extended pivot. The running seconds hand sits on that pivot. When you push that seconds hand on, it actually goes on that tip right there. And it's designed that way because the that wheel, and basically all the watches that we work on, the fourth wheel there, it spins around, It the wheel itself spins around once a minute. So it makes it perfect for a seconds hand. Okay, now we can get this uh, train wheel bridge back on. It's a little tricky. Definitely a little bit tricky. So why don't we stabilize said bridge? Yeah, so the trick here is there's, there's three jewels on the top and we need to have the pivots from all three of those wheels into those jewels before we do anything that requires any pressure. Definitely screwing down the screws, but also even, you know, anything else. Because you can break one of those pivots so easily as I described before. Oh, this one's jumpy. Huh. Yeah, you know, some watches are just finicky about this. Um, there's not a lot of room here. You can see this bridge is kind of an odd shape. And we just have to be patient and keep trying until they actually sit in. Oh, did it go in? I think it might have. Yes, there we go. So now we got all the pivots in because you can see when I turn the barrel that all the other wheels spin as well. And that lets you know that they're all connected and where they're supposed to be. So once again, I'm gonna use the clear plastic stick here just to make sure that it stays that way. Because when you're putting in a screw, when you're reaching for something, anything can shift around and you just have to be extra careful. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, so now we've got that in place and we can continue with the winding works and such now. This is that little gear that goes on top of the barrel. And I think it's just friction fit, so I'm just gonna, yeah, push it down. And there's kind of a washer in the middle. And if you remember, this was the weird one. This is the two crown wheels. And you can see one of them engages with that weird pinion that kept falling off. And then the other one engages with the uh, barrel, with the, with the ratchet wheel. So that must be how it transfers that power over. See, they both spin when you turn it.
And now I can put this sort of elaborate click mechanism in here. Yeah, see, it's still, I'm just a little confused about how it works, but when I don't know for sure, I'll usually just go ahead and, and keep assembling and then revisit. But you see how that part just isn't, like there's nothing pushing on it. I just don't know how it's supposed to stop the ratchet wheel from turning if there's nothing to apply pressure. But like I said, sometimes it sorts itself out and you go, oh, okay, four, four steps later. That was the thing that pushes on that. So I can replace the ratchet wheel now that I've got this sort of sub ratchet wheel in place. This one here. And this is the real one. Hmm. Okay. Is it going to sit flat? Yeah, I think it will. And once again, we can reinstall it. So this movement, you know, it's kind of one of those ones where you feel a little bit lost, but you just keep going and then things are coming together and maybe it's not so bad. So let's see if I wind it up manually here. It did look actually like the click may have caught it there. So yeah, maybe there's something that I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, now we can put the pallet fork back in though. And the pallet fork bridge goes on top of that. And it just takes one screw here. And yeah, this is not working. I just, I, I tried to wind it and it would just unwind and this part just doesn't have any pressure on it. You can see it can just sort of move freely back and forth, but it needs something. And I figured out exactly what that something is. So this is footage from when I was taking apart the watch and take a look at what falls out. Remember when I said something might've gotten chewed up in there? Take a look, that is the remnants of a now fully rusted out spring. That spring was underneath that plate, something got underneath there and it disintegrated over time. And that of course meant that I needed a new spring to replace it. Now I got really lucky <laughs> in multiple ways here. First off, I had bought an additional one of these watches off of eBay because I wanted to make uh, two of them. So I actually was able to source this spring from that watch. The other thing is I dropped this spring on the ground and I couldn't find it. And I had the flashlight and the magnets for an hour and a half and I couldn't. And I thought, well, that's it. Now I have to wait and try to find the part on eBay. But a good friend of mine came over and she said, well, I want to take a look for it. And I tried to explain how small this part was and how impossible it was going to be to find it but she spent about 10 minutes looking for it and goes, is this it? And it was, and I'm back on track. But can I actually wind it? Yes, there we go. See, that's what it's supposed to do. And now I can actually wind this thing up. Quick check of the pallet fork looks like it's looking good. And this is the moment of truth. We can now put the balance wheel in and see if that was the only problem. <laughs> Because sometimes it's multiple things and I'd really like it if this would start up. Come on. Come on. Yes. Yes. It is running. Fantastic. That's exactly the best news that you can see. Because I'm going to tell you, these old beat up watches, I mean, you can see the damage this thing's taken on the inside of the watch, right? It's been through a lot. There's all types of different gremlins and things that can go on. And to see this thing running is an absolute joy. I am so excited that this thing's back and running again. But of course, we do have a question we need to answer. Does the alarm work? And more importantly, what does it sound like? Let's try it. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, well, that's an alarm sound, I guess. That would wake you up. Um, weird. Uh, but yeah, anyway, let's, uh, we'll, we'll do that again later. Don't worry. But uh, let, let's get it on the microscope because we got some jewels to oil here. Just a tiny bit of oil in the right spot for each of the jewels. We'll make sure that they're operating under optimal conditions and for the longest time possible. That, of course, also means that we need to clean the jewels that go on top and the bottom of the balance. I'm going to show you the top one here. This is it. It's a sandwich. Isn't everything a sandwich? This is definitely a sandwich. It has two pieces and then inside there's some meat, but it's not meat, it's oil. Does that fly? Is that, does that make sense? Uh, at any rate, all you have to do now is clean this in like a solvent and then replace so that it removes any old oil, crusty dirt, anything like that, and then replace the oil and then uh, put the other piece of bread back on and then you can put it back into the watch. So I'll show you right here. I'm gonna use some huge tweezers, the biggest ones I have, that puts a drop of oil there. And now I can take the other half, yeah, that. Oop, careful. There we go. And then boom, just like that. Now they're back together. And the capillary action from that oil will hold that top in place as well. And now I can replace it right back in the watch. Oh, little, little crooked. No big deal though. Just a little nudge. It should jump into place. Should jump. There we go. So that sits nicely there and that suspends oil directly above that pivot. And as you can see, that pivot works very, very hard. It's constantly going and it's other under a pretty significant load. So it's really important that it stay fully lubricated all the time. Then I can just simply turn this little shock spring back into place. And once I've done so, that's a done deal. Let's see how it looks on the time graph where we didn't get to get an initial reading, an initial reading because it wasn't running. But after some tweaking on here. This thing's running really nicely, actually. 255 degrees of amplitude and only minus three, minus four seconds a day. That's great. I'm really happy, actually. This, this watch is actually a runner. Okay, let's uh, address the outside of this watch a little bit, at least. Um, the case is actually in quite good shape, and I ultrasonically cleaned it, and it looks good, but it does need a new crystal. I'm just not happy with how cloudy that crystal has gotten. Little scratches you can just buff out, but if it actually, the plastic itself or acrylic as it were, um, gets cloudy, it's kind of a done deal. The good news is crystals are actually very cheap. They're only a few bucks uh, for a really high quality new one. And that's what I've got here. I'm gonna use this press to reinstall it. Oop. And all I have to do is undo the press once the crystal is in place and it will simply expand into the bezel. And just like that, we get a beautiful, clean, new crystal on this so that we can show off the patina on that dial. I'm a big patina guy. People tend to fall into two camps. They either love it or they hate it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you can see the age on this dial and I think it looks so cool. I wouldn't touch that thing at all. Like even if I, like at this point, even if I thought that it would clean up, I wouldn't do it but I know that there's gonna be a bunch of you that are like, what? You should clean the dial. Not me though. All right, first hand to go on is the alarm hand. It's really cool. You can see it's blued, and, but it has a red painted tip and it's a neat little hand. I mean, it's just a, it completely changes the look of this watch having an extra hand and the fact that they made it kind of more colorful and cool really adds to it. Now the hour hand can go on. And just make sure that it's exactly at midnight. And I can put the minute hand on after that. It doesn't matter on watches like this what hour you put it at, but it does have to be directly on an hour. I like midnight because I can get the hands lined up visually. It just makes it a little easier. Uh, I can also kind of see how they're, like if one hand is touching the other one right away. And you can see, looks good, everything's lined up. One more hand to put on. And that's the seconds hand. So we'll just whoop, put that on. And now we can recase the watch. As I mentioned, I put the case through the ultrasonic cleaner. 
But that's all I'm going to do to it. It's in good shape. I like the wear it has on. I'm not going to polish it or do anything. To me, it fits this watch perfectly. The wear. Okay, so top crown in first. A little bit tricky to because I have to suspend the watch. Like I can't lay it down on the hands. And then I can put in the bottom crown. And now I can put the bezel on, but first I'm gonna use an air blower to make sure that there's no dust or debris on the dial or on the bezel. And I can just click this bezel back into place and I can put the back on. And it's really interesting because what I realized is that post that we found at the beginning is actually what the hammer hits up against. So it's a really cool design. I actually have to press this back, uh, back on too. It won't click on with my fingers. But the design is that it uses the case back itself as a way to amplify and change the quality of the sound. So it sounds a little bit more like a ringing, but not quite, but it makes it louder and more pronounced because of the way they did it. And I just think that's such a cool design to use that case back as an acoustic element. So why don't we listen to it again? <laughs> it's kind of an absurd thing, but it really does actually work. Yeah. So the way it works is you set the alarm with the bottom crown and then you pull it out and the pulling out the bottom crown just says, I want the alarm to be on. So like you set it on your bedside table, or you can even wear it like that if you want. And then when that time hits, it'll go off. And it is interesting because you can actually feel it too. So if you were wearing the watch, you would feel it on your wrist vibrating. <laughs> but look how beautiful this, this watch is with a new strap. That crystal really did wonders for it because it shows off kind of that beautiful dial with the nice wear. I love the font on the Bulova and on wrist alarm. Really awesome little watch. And uh, I'm super stoked to get it back on somebody's wrist so that they can enjoy it too. Plus, it has a really fun little quirk to it. That's going to do it for this video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and uh, going on my journey of watchmaking with me. I really appreciate you hanging out. If you'd like to find me on Instagram. I do have one. It's wristwatch underscore revival over there. And I'll post pictures and sometimes some in-between project updates and stuff when I can. And I'd, I'd love to say hi. With that, I just want to say thanks again for hanging out and we'll see you next time.